So we're a little bit late in the evening tonight. This is going to be a nighttime all hell can't stop us edition. And I'm just going to skip the music and the intro today because I have, it is getting kind of late and I don't want to bother upstairs neighbors unnecessarily. Anyway, so what is this, this podcast, if you're listening to it for the first time? Uh, this is a weekly broadcast. I've been doing it for over half a year. And it's kind of a, a record of what's going on in the world, what's going on in my life. And it's an alternative to things like the RAA. And so getting into the meat of the show today, the first thing I wanted to talk about is something that happened within the past day or two, and that is that the, let's see, where do we start here? Uh, Richard, Richard Stallman has resigned from the new project. And so the GNU project, I, I'm going to talk more about the GNU project in a bit, but Tech Rights is one of the many places where this is being kind of talked about. And I want to kind of go through their article. We'll kind of go deeper as we go from there. So, quote, Torvalds and Stallman are both being besieged, albeit in somewhat different ways. Both are also at different stages of apparently staged, quote, phase out. It's all happening so quickly. MIT, Free Software Foundation, and now GNU. He's being cancelled. As reported by Pharonix, Stallman sought to clarify that he had remained in charge of GNU, but posted a short time ago this odd contradictory update. I hereby step down as the head of the GNU project, effective immediately. Richard Stallman. Only two days earlier, Stallman wrote as a formal statement, not as a reply to anything. Quote, with a little bit of a preface for the NSA and FBI agents. Quote, on September 16th, I resigned as president of the Free Software Foundation, but the GNU project and the Free Software Foundation are not the same. I'm still head of the GNU project, the chief GNUissance, and I intend to continue as such. Dr. Richard Stallman, founder of Free Software Foundation, Internet Hall of Famer. It's very clear that something happened. Someone contacted him. One can guess. No further details is given. As Darwin Elf put it in our IRC channel, first RMS said he's remaining as head of the GNU project because it's not the same as the Free Software Foundation. Now only a free, or now a few days later he says he stepped down as head of GNU. Is the theory he was being pressured slash ordered by bad actors? It's on Stallman.org, his news slash political section. I don't want it to be taken over by Leonard slash Red Hat slash IBM Yes Man. RMS turned into that anyway, Mince R joked. He was referring to Stallman's reluctance to say something negative about System D. System D, of course, is a, a software system that is common in GNU Linux distributions, uh, such as Debian, Ubuntu, and a bunch of others. And it is one of the, how do I put this? It is a replacement for something called the, the init system, which controls kind of hard to describe at a very general level, but uh, it, it kind of controls some basic functions of the operating system. And the way it is designed is that it's designed similar to how some, it's, it's designed with system maintenance in mind and designed with high level understanding of how the system in particular works in a similar kind of way that Microsoft Windows at least was at one point designed. And on a technical level, you can think good things and bad things about it. It is free software. Anyone can look at the code. Anyone can understand the code. There have been a lot of really bad bugs in it, and bugs that of the sort that really shouldn't exist in any operating system at all. And sometimes when it fails, it fails really hard. So you can kind of render your system completely unbootable by really minor ways. And so to that extent, it has introduced a level of instability and uncertainty into the GNU Linux operating system that it's been used on. But it has been embraced. And there are technical reasons, good reasons, why it has been embraced. And there is politics involved and technical reasons. And we can get into this, the whole system D and why it's good or bad later. But there's definitely a lot of people who would have pressured him to come out against system D. And I could also see him wanting to n not get involved. <laughs> so uh, good on Stallman for trying to stay clear of that debate. But, but either way, Richard Stallman, the re legendary RMS, seems to have been incapacitated. What a major catastrophic loss for the free software movement. Now, it is important to note 
that Richard Stallman is just one man. And he is the person who started the free software movement. And he's the person who has articulated its goals and its designs on changing the world in the most clear and ethically uncompromising way. He's always had a set of principles that he has stuck to, and he has moved the world with those principles. And it's shown us all that they actually do work, and that when we think of things using his frame, using his ideas, a lot of crises are averted, and we do not find ourselves locked in a Microsoft world where we have no control over the technology around us. And I do intend on talking more about this in the following couple of shows. However, I, I just wanted to point out that he is one man, and we should have expected that someday we would lose him. Now, whether or not this is just purely a retirement thing, because he is getting old, after all. He was getting old like 10 years ago when I saw him. And it's, again, been 10 years, so he's he must be nearing retirement age at this point. Or if there is some political pressure that got to him. Now, the context behind that is recently, and I, I don't even really care to dig up the particular comments or the exact quotes or anything like that, but as some of you may be aware, there's a political crisis in the States going on where some really high-level pedophiles have been caught. At least one really high-level pedophile has been caught and killed himself before being charged and before the court case was able to get through. Uh, one Jeffrey Epstein ran a whole network of young girls for the rich and powerful, both in the United States and abroad. And one of Richard Stallman's mentors was one of the men who purportedly t took part in Epstein's uh, sexual escapades with young girls. And Richard Stallman, in some way, stood up to defend him. Now, the way that he defended him was that the person in question, his mentor, his former mentor, who ran and perhaps even started the MIT AI lab where the free software movement got its very beginnings, is dead. And there's no one really left to defend him against accusations and anything of where it, it, well, it is useful to believe the victim of a sexual assault, especially when the victim was a young girl. There's still kind of something to be said about the balancing that with something. Now, I, I personally would disagree with Rick Stallman on this one as far as the particular person. I think it was M Minsky. Uh, don't quote me on that part, but if, if the girls are naming him, he probably did participate. I, I would find it unlikely that he didn't. Now, as far as whether or not we should absolutely, you know, take their, their word at 100% accurate, I don't know. I don't know enough about the case. I, I don't think Richard knew enough about the case. And perhaps nobody does. And then I think that was kind of his point, in that there is kind of a margin of doubt there worth considering. And there, there's a reason that there exist things like trials and courts and stuff like that. Uh, and that if there was such a trial, then oh, by all means, hang the guy, even after he's dead. But we haven't had the trial, so we can't know for sure. Now, that in and of itself was enough that he got political blowback on that. Enough that he seems to have been removed from his main projects. For, for thinking outside of the orthodoxy and demanding some kind of a rule of law before we just hang witches, even when sexual assault is on the table. And you can agree or disagree with that, but the level of political change in the world that he has affected is the head of these two movements, the Free Software Foundation and the GNU Project. Very tightly coupled, but two separate things. It's awesome, and it's very, very notable that this is the thing. This, this desire for a treatment of justice before condemning people is the thing that did him in, or appears to be. We don't have hard proof of that, but, quote, uh, from Roy Jesuits, quote, they made Torvalds and RMS beg for forgiveness from those whose precious feelings were, quote, hurt, unquote, by an opinion, however honest. I know those tactics. Hashtag guilt, hashtag control, hashtag original sin. 
And so there's a point here in that you can disagree with Stallman on this. It's fine to disagree with Stallman on this. He's probably wrong, but it's his honest opinion. And I don't think that the desire for justice as an honest opinion is so bad, so utterly noxious that it warrants taking the life's work of someone away in such a huge and uncontrolled way. Now, maybe I'm going way out on a limb there, but it's worth thinking about whether that's an overreaction, that having a wrong opinion on something like that. I mean, perhaps he's hurt the feelings of the victims. He's a powerful person, and he, by demeaning their suffering in that sense, maybe there, there is some feelings hurt there. But is that level of hurt feelings really worth, again, removing someone's life work, life's work, of a global movement, a global project, of a huge magnitude. The GNU project has one of the most successful written documents ever created by any human being. The GNU GPL is spread so far. There are so many copies of it out there. It competes with the, the Bible as far as number of copies in existence. This is the scale and the scope of the consequence of having the wrong opinion in 2019 of being outside of political correctness in 2019, of being outside of what is acceptable opinion on even something as, as politically charged as Epstein, of having a nuanced view of the world. Because you know right well that there's some level of nuance in what Stalin thinks, and that maybe it's self-serving. Maybe it's because it's his mentor. Maybe there's that kind of extra level of defense there. But even so, you can expect a one. If you can expect anything out of Stallman, it's sticking to principles of justice and principles of fairness. And so, it's it's a sad thing to see him step down. But he is, after all, one man, and there are a lot of people in the free software movement, and a lot of people in the GNU project, and all of the users and all of the developers involved. We can and must replace him and continue on without him. And the following months are going to see what exactly happens when when we lose something that important, how much damage that is actually going to be. But it is noteworthy this doesn't happen in a vacuum. This happens after Microsoft bought GitHub and after the free software community has neglected to move off of GitHub in a serious way. It happens after Linus Torvalds was forced to step down as the head of the Linux project, the Linux kernel project. He's since rejoined as the head, but only after a code of conduct was introduced demanding ideological conformity from all developers who participate in submitting code to the kernel. Ideological conformity that conforms with Microsoft's worldview and Microsoft's requirement for ideological conformity in all free software projects hosted on their, their system. And so uh, software is becoming entangled in political questions and entangled in ideology. You could even say it's being entangled in religion in a big way in 2019. And as we go forward, the voices that can help get us out of that situation, like Stallman and like Torvalds, people who are willing to speak the truth and people who are willing to speak up for the fairness of treatment of people by others and the fairness of the tools in their relation to us the freedom of us and how that can actually be defined and actually be developed when we think about using things in a fair way with other people being involved and, and when we have people who are willing to speak the truth willing to to think through the consequences of it how we organize our lives at a high level and how we organize the tools in our lives at a high level and those people start getting removed and we start being told that we can't ask questions and we can't argue with each other when we find problems with the ideologies in our lives it is a dark place to be when we're when such people are removed and we find that there is no voice of richard stallman out there speaking up for the wrongs in our life there is no voice like Richard Stallman speaking out against the wrongs committed against us and committed against other people who are much less powerful than us. When there's no one like Richard Stallman to warn us, 
of the dangers of the path we are pursuing. It is a dark place to be. But it's not the only thing going on in the world right now and that I wanted to talk about today. There's also something that I've talked about a couple of times, and I just want to kind of mention it, because maybe some people haven't heard of this topic. And when I, when I talk about what it, things in terms of a permission culture, maybe it's a term that they haven't really encountered or haven't really read about. But a permission culture is, and a free culture, are basically two ways of looking at culture. And what, what is culture? Culture is just like a way of living a way of organizing your life, a way of thinking about your life. It, it includes memes, it includes things like food, dance, and language, and technology in our lives, and basically everything about how we live our lives, That especially things that can be shared. And so what a permission culture is, it is when you have to ask permission before you participate in culture, where you have to ask permission, especially from a central authority, before you're able to engage in the parts of your life in question. And a free culture, then, is something that is not a permission culture. It is something where you are at liberty to go about your life and live and to do the things that you would perhaps like to do, and as long as they're not negatively impacting others. That, that kind of goes into a different line. Some, sometimes people confuse permission cultures and consent cultures as if the two were completely the same. You can have a free culture that's also a consent respecting culture, a culture that respects other people's autonomy. Conversely, you can have a free culture that doesn't, and that where people are just sort of oblivious to each other and violate each other's boundaries all the time. Similarly, you can have a permission culture where the central authority allows the people on the edges to violate each other's autonomy as long as they don't threaten the central authority. And the central authority can be a government, it can be a king, or a kingdom, or a, a monarchy, it can be a, a company. The cultures can be of many different scales, many different sizes. A culture can, and subcultures can get fractally small in terms of, the, the, there's a really good XKCD comic where it shows two people arguing about, I think it's a twisted straws or something like that, and that there's so many subcultures and that you can break every culture into a smaller and smaller subset and a smaller and smaller subculture, that it isn't just that there's a culture of people interested in twisty straws, it's the different kinds of twisty straws, and then the people who are interested in one kind of twisty straws has a their in-group, then they think the people in their out-group, the, the other twisty straw people, have a different idea of what a twisty straw can be, and they're wrong, and, and so on and so forth. But the point here is that in every single one of these subcultures, no matter how small, maybe it's just you and a couple of friends versus the other group, you can compare which is more free and which is not in respect to the ways that control happens in your culture and control and power is expressed. And especially when we start thinking of technology in our lives and designing the technology in our lives and using the technology in our lives, who has control over how that technology is developed and used is kind of an important question. And the answer to that question becomes, that's the authority kind of w that we're talking about here. And if an authority can control who uses what technology, who uses what tools, then they can either choose to be a permission culture or a free culture. And so if that technology is something like the printing press, there have been cultures and countries where the printing press was controlled. The Soviet Union in the 80s and, and before controlled who was allowed to print documents. Nowadays, in most of the world, anyone can print documents, but there's a level of control expressed because the printers, or at least computer printers, track or print, print little yellow tracking dots on all the documents printed. And so while you're technically allowed to print whatever you want, if you print the wrong thing, it'll get back to you. And so there's that kind of level of control expressed. And we don't have to ask necessarily permission to print things, but again, there's this level of control there that if we print the wrong thing, things can kind of get, or it can be traced to you. If you try to print money, for example, in Canada, that you will be charged. They will find you and they'll catch you and they'll put you away for that. If you try to print copyrighted material in Canada, 
and manufacture it in, in a big scale, again, you'll get caught, you'll get put in jail. You could compare and contrast that with China from, like, say, 10 years ago. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not like this or still not like this today, but there was lots of places where you could go to buy basically black market CDs and black market pretty much anything you wanted. And they would just copy whatever CD or DVD or movie or music or document or book or whatever. And you could get that, that copy in, in these markets. And that was, in a sense, a more free place in reference to those CDs, those books, those whatever it was, because there was no permission required in practice for them to to make and sell it to. Now, in the context of China in the 90s, there actually was laws in China preventing that sort of thing. But they just weren't really enforced. Or when they were, it wasn't enforced strongly enough. And so that that's kind of like the next step on top of that. So if there are rules, are the rules actually enforced? If there are if they're enforced, are they enforced strongly enough that they can actually keep the behavior down? Same thing kind of like with uh, file sharing in the early 2000s, where uh, in the States there were all sorts of people being sued, and it was illegal, but even with that going on, practically everyone still did it. And something like 40% of Americans plus uh, still traded music on the file sharing networks and thought nothing of it uh, for the most part. Uh, which goes to the next step, which is how people think about what they're doing. If you think what you're doing is piracy, if you think what you're doing is a form of stealing or taking that it is bad, then that's, again, a level of culture where you start thinking of things in terms of you needing permission and feeling guilty about violating that need for permission versus, again, a, an alternative culture, perhaps parts of Europe during the same period of time in the States where most people didn't care. Most people just thought, oh, hey, half this stuff is, isn't sold in my country anyway. It's, it's not a big deal if we just go and take it. And so, again, the, there's all kinds of subcultures in the world and all kinds of groups of people, and you can always compare which is more free and which is more uh, requiring of permission from a central authority. And when we start thinking in terms of this, we start to notice that there are negative consequences for these permission or these systems that require permission from central authorities to especially share useful information and share cultural information and share information that allows people to make have meaning in their lives uh, to to escape depression for, for example and information that allows them to accomplish functional things in both cases over and over and over again we see that the benefits are there for sharing and the drawbacks are really not. Now that there are drawbacks for people who are entrenched into certain ways of living and making a living off of the authority that being able to create and manage how other people interact with culture is represented. But again, that, that's something that the culture, the society, the, the people involved have to balance uh, how they are going to continue to have culture. And so there's always kind of this balance between permission culture and free cultures. And should we become more of a permission culture or more of a free culture? What are the benefits and, and, and drawbacks of each particular choice? But it isn't always a universal benefit to go to more control. And especially the people with the control tend to have more power and political power and access to the, the system of control than those who are benefit and stand to benefit from less of a permission culture. And so they will they tend to get their way and, and their laws passed and their rules put into effect, whereas the the benefits for the, on the free culture side tend to be kind of more diffused. And so while they're, they're greater, or they tend to be greater, it's, it's harder to have them and keep them, generally. So it's, it's worth thinking about in term, some things in terms of that which I'll get into more in detail later. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the Star Chamber. And so what was the Star Chamber? Quote, and in English history, a civil, it was a civil and criminal court named after sh the star-shaped ceiling decoration. And I've seen pictures of it. It, it wasn't just star-shaped. It was also had, like, lots of stars on it. Like, it was painted like a sky. So you walk into this room, and you're, like, in this weird, starry, dark place. Uh, anyway, continuing on. Quote, in the Palace of Westminster, London, where its first meetings were held, 
created in 1487 by Henry VII, the Star Chamber uh, comprised some 20 or 30 judges. Why bring this up? Why bring this ancient court up? Well, let's see some of the examples of what actually happened in this chamber. Quote, on October 17, 1632, the court of the Star Chamber banned, quote, all news books, so basically newspapers, because of complaints from Spanish and Austrian diplomats that coverage of the Thirty Years' War in England was unfair. So imagine that. Imagine some foreign country comes, or some diplomat from some foreign country, let's say the United States, comes to Canada and says, well, the way you're talking about our war in Iran, say, is totally unfair, and it makes our great leader, Emperor God Trump, look bad. It makes him look like he has small hands or something. As a result, quote, all news books pertaining to this matter, so I mean, all newspapers pertaining to the Iran, Iran war, just stop being published. Done. <laughs> so, quote, as a result, all news books pertaining to this matter were often printed in Amsterdam and then smuggled into the country. So, going back to the last example, so in 1632, the ability to print material in England was a highly controlled thing by the central power, by the monarchy, through the court of the Star Chamber. So, it, by comparison, the Netherlands and Amsterdam was a free culture. And if you wanted to learn about the world, you had to print your material in Amsterdam, and that's what they did. Anyway, continuing on, quote, and then smuggled into the country until control of the press collapsed with the developing ideological conflict of 1640 through 41. Which is another good point, because permission cultures don't have to last forever. Political conflict can break them, and break them hard, and it's worth pointing out that history provides examples for us to look back on and say, yeah, actually, like, there were conditions of control far stronger than what we experience today, and they were broken, and they were broken really, really well, and things like the conflict of 1640 happen over the long run. Anyway, continuing on. In the Star Chamber, the Council could inflict any punishment short of death, and frequently subject its objects of its wrath to the pillory, to whipping and cutting off of ears. And I've also seen reference to stuff like people being branded with hot iron, all, all kinds of, of weird, messed up, sadistic things. Quote, with each embarrassment to the arbitrary power, the Star Chamber became emboldened to undertake further usurpation. The Star Chamber finally summoned juries before it for verdicts disagreeable to the government and fined and imprisoned them. I.e., it became a kind of court to charge other courts for going against the government. Juries, i.e. jurors, i.e. people who are charged with coming to a fair decision. And then that in and of itself, that gets punished. And punished in really, really fucked up ways. Quote, it spread terrorism among those who were called to do constitutional acts. It imposed ruinous fines. It became the chief defense of Charles against the assault, or against assaults upon those ur usurpations which cost him his life. So, why is this relevant? Why, why bring up this really messed up court? Well, here's one example of why it's relevant. Quote, most students of copyright are familiar with how the Statute of Anne arose in 1710 from a licensing system of the Stationers' Company. Organized in 1557 by the Royal Prerogative, this guild provided the British Crown with a soft form of censorship, and the members of the guild with a coordinated monopoly. I.e., this is a permission culture. Prior to 1710, if you wanted to buy books, you had to buy them from this group of people who controlled the right to publish books. There was basically um, no... You can imagine, like, there was no public da domain to speak of. So you, if you wanted to read any of the great books, again, you had to buy it from people who control the one place to get it from. And they extracted extreme monopoly rent. And the literacy of the country suffered greatly as a result. Anyway, continuing on. And the members of the guild with a coordinated monopoly in which each publisher respected the other's claims to exclusive publishing rights in particular works through an official registry. The guild's monopoly position was legally guaranteed, first by the Star Chamber's decrees promulgated from 1556 through 1637, and then with the Star Chamber's abolition in 1640 by parliamentary ordinances and statutes repeatedly renewed until the last statute expired in 1694. So in other words, the history of this court is really, really deeply tied up with the history of copyright law. And we think, and when we think about giving people the ability to control what other people 
print, what other people are allowed to write, what other people are allowed to put into books, which is the first case of what copyright covered, really. That is where this came from. And wh when we think of why they had that right, it was because we had this absolute court, or a ab court of an absolute monarch that was allowed to go just run rampant over all kinds of rights and just do whatever they want, charge whoever they want with basically no... I mean, they had to do... They had to justify it according to the law, but you were not allowed to... Or you were not allowed to basically stay silent. And when they charged you with something, you had to admit it. And if you didn't admit it, they would assume that you were just not admitting something because you were guilty. And then they would continue on and charge you with it. So it was kind of a joke how bad the the process was. But it eventually ended. And it ended with the Habeas Corpus Act of 1640, going back to this kind of previous video. Because there was one particular case, and I don't know very much about that one particular case, but there was one particular case where the, the outcome of the court was just seen by the public as so utterly unfair. And such a travesty of justice that the Parliament was called to act on it, and they did. And they made it so that uh, you again, you had to be in order to be imprisoned. You had to have the right to know why you were being charged. You, there had to be some level of evidence against you, and so on and so forth. Whereas the Star Chamber, none of those things matter. All that mattered was that if you were, if you came up with something that the government didn't like, they would find a way to charge you. They they would use their legal trickery to get an outcome very similar to how right now in the United States. Uh, if you're charged in their courts, their prosecutors have like an obscenely high percentage of people who are found guilty or plead guilty right away. It's, it's like way, way above 90%. And so people like, for example, Jeremy Hammond, when they are called into a court, they'll plead guilty to something because the alternative is being charged and pleading to guilty for something much, much worse, with a much, much bigger penalty. And sure, the penalties aren't getting your, your face branded with hot iron and tortured on the pillory, but they're pretty bad. And so that's kind of worth comparing to the Star Chamber, even if it isn't really all the way as bad as the Star Chamber. But the, what the Star Ch Chamber represents in the Western legal tradition is it, just like the free culture thing, there's no culture that's absolutely free, and there's no culture that's absolutely a permission culture. Well, as much as Microsoft would love to build one sometimes. There's, there was no court that wasn't absolutely a star chamber. Even the, the star chamber, in some ways, didn't live up to this kind of idealized, messed up court with Alice in Wonderland-like rules where you're just going to lose your head no matter what. But it is a useful concept to compare things, compare other courts to, when they start acting in an unfair fashion. The Cornell uh, Law website says that it's, quote, synonymous with any unfair and secretive proceedings, unquote, which is pretty much accurate in that, again, you, you as a member of the public wouldn't necessarily know the outcome or the, the process that they went through to get to the outcome. Unlike in Canada, most courts are, you can go to Kenway and you can go to other sources to get, you can go to the court and you can be an observer of it. There are some minor exceptions, uh, but the, built into our law, there are things to allow those exceptions to not turn too unfair. And so it, it's worth considering that it is possible to have a society, our society, any, any government, establish one of these courts that's just completely and utterly unfair, and where the principle of justice just isn't important, where the end result of charging the guy and damn the consequences has been done and we can we usually have a pretty good idea of when it happens that it's happened and i just wanted to kind of bring that up uh, for kind of later purposes uh, another thing that's going on is as i mentioned jeremy hammond quote this is from the courage foundation imprisoned activist jeremy hammond called against his will to testify before the federal grand jury the edva Virginia grand jury believed to be the same probe that previously called on Chelsea Manning and David House. And so basically, Jared's been called before this federal grand jury in the Eastern District of Virginia. He was removed from the 
FCI Memphis, which where Tennessee, where he was serving a 10-year prison sentence after pleading guilty because, again, the alternative was much worse, and they would probably get him charged anyway, whether or not he did anything illegal, never mind wrong. But in this case, quote, he hacked the private intelligence contractor Stratford for Earth, Stratford Global Intelligence, uh, for the WikiLeaks Stratford leak. And, I mean, be that as it may, there is a public benefit to that data being out there. And so, but even so, he's been serving his time, and it's almost at the 10-year mark. He's almost released, and now they move him to this grand jury to testify against WikiLeaks, presumably. And it's the same one that char did the same thing to Chelsea Manning. Now, on Chelsea Manning's side, Chelsea Manning has been imprisoned without charge, without trial, for refusing to testify in this for 200 plus days. And they'll keep her for the rest of her life if she doesn't test. Similarly, with Hammond, they could keep him in prison for the rest of his life. No further charges. And he is of, of such a character that you can pretty much expect for him to not uh, snitch, <laughs> to not uh, talk and give the details that this, this grand jury wants them to give. So anyway, go, going back to the, the Courage article, quote, Jeremy pled guilty in 2013 in the Southern District of New York of one count of violating the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, i.e. the same law that Aaron Schwartz wound up killing himself rather than being charged with. Continuing on, he agreed to plead guilty pursuant to a non-cooperative plea agreement that Grant him immunity from further prosecution in all 94 federal judicial districts. At the time of his guilty plea, Jeremy made a statement that made it clear that he was pleading guilty so he could f speak freely about his actions and move on with his life without putting anyone else in jeopardy. Today I will plead guilty to one count of violating the CFAA. This was a very difficult decision. I hope this statement will explain my reasoning. I believe in the power of truth. I believe in keeping that I do not want to hide what I did or shy away from my actions. This non-cooperating plea agreement frees me to tell the world what I did and why, without exposing any tactics or information to the government with, and without jeopardizing the lives and well-being of other activists on and offline. And that's the point. He is a, a very strong character in that he will go to the grave, no doubt, to protect other activists from the government locking them up, from killing them, from torturing them, etc. Quote, he pled guilty because he had no interest in cooperating with the government. He was sentenced to 10 years, the maximum allowed under his plea agreement, and has been serving his time, counting down the day till he will be finally free. That day was supposed to come in mid-December of 2019, i.e. only a couple of months. Quote, the government's effort to compel Jeremy, Jeremy to testify is punitive, and mean spirited. Jeremy has spent nearly 10 years in prison because of his commitment to his firmly held beliefs. There is no way he would ever testify before a grand jury. The government knew this when they gave him immunity in every federal jurisdiction exchange for his guilty plea. In bringing him against his will to the Eastern District of Virginia, the government has put an end to his participation in the RDAP drug program, effectively adding a year to his sentence. If Jeremy had been permitted to complete the nine month program, he would have earned a 12-month sentence reduction. When he refuses to testify, his sentence will be prolonged indefinitely, and when he is punished with further incarceration for contempt of a court order to testify. Like grand, brave grand jury resistors before him, including Chelsea Manning, Jeremy believes that grand juries are repressive tools of the government used to investigate and intimidate activist communities and are abused by prosecutors to gain access to intelligence to which they are not entitled. The U.S. government's blatant abuse of the grand jury process in this case continues a clear pattern of targeting, isolating, and punishing outspoken truth-tellers and activists. Pause. I would also point out that the, this is a continuation of an Obama program and an Obama war on whistleblowers and activists. But it is a, tr a Trump uh, action. This is something the Trump government will have to be held to account for when the history books look on, well, what exactly did Trump do? Well, uh, the Trump government put Jeremy Hammond away for the rest of his life. That's going to be the, the fact of the matter, unless he's uh, pardoned by a future president. And we can go more into detail of what uh, Hammond did and that sort of thing, but the, the point here is that this hits close to home. Uh, Jared was a friend of mine. I would still consider him a friend, although I haven't talked to him in well, 10 years since he's been locked up. I'd love to. I'd love to hear uh, his point of view and to, to get 
back connected him, in touch with him, but it's basically impossible right now. And it looks like it's going to be impossible forever. This is the loss of a friend. This is a loss of a friend because of the Trump government's war on whistleblowers. This this hurts me on a personal level. And sure, I wasn't always or I wasn't that close. We hung out a fair bit, and for a time we were close. But that was a long time ago. But even so, this is a this is personal. This is this is something that I mean we. I, I'm proud to have had him in my life, given that this is this is how he's going to go, and this is what his life is going to be like. He is living proof that you can live up to your principles, even when the full weight of the U.S. government is upon you, and that the rest of us can be inspired, and that we can make a difference in the world, as he has. And so that is one of the things this week that is uh, kind of worth pointing out. I, I do think the broadcast has probably gone on long enough, though, this week. Hopefully the audio has been okay. I do have two separate sources this week. Uh, hopefully they're loud enough to hear. But uh, I will see you all next week, and hopefully we'll have a guest uh, next week. This week, I think everyone kind of bailed. So uh, I will see you all next week. And who knows what time, again, with my work schedule with the election, it's getting really zany trying to get this show recorded. So uh, we'll see what time that happens. See you in the next show.